Well, good morning, and thank you for being with us here at our weekend services at Christ Community Chapel. Whether you're here in the sanctuary over in East Hall or watching online, we're glad that you are with us. My name is Zach. I'm on staff here at CCC running Orchard NEO, our church planting initiative. Uh, But for now, it's my pleasure to finish up our November sermon series we're calling Surprisingly Simple Ways to make Jesus famous. Making Jesus famous is our annual theme. It's our focus for the year. And the goal of this sermon series is to make sure that we don't think that making Jesus famous is the work of professionals. That when we talk about making Jesus famous, what we don't necessarily mean, at least what we don't only mean, is what pastors do or what missionaries or Bible teachers do. But rather, the goal of this series is to focus on everyday ways that we can make Jesus famous. Simple, not because they're easy, but simple because they're accessible to us. We can all go out this week and forgive. We can all go out this week and be generous or be hospitable. Or this week, what we're looking at is the topic of obedience, that our obedience makes Jesus famous. So if you have your Bibles, would you open it to Ephesians Chapter 4, we're going to look at verses 25 through chapter 5, verse 2. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. If you don't have a Bible, the verses are going to be on the screen behind me. By the way, if you don't have a Bible and you would like one, if you stop at that next steps area in the atrium that Val was talking about a minute ago, uh, it would be our pleasure to give you one or to give you one to give a family member or to give a friend. Just stop by there and let them know you need a Bible. They'd be happy to help you out. But for now, uh, the words will be on the screen behind me. Here's what it says in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is God's word. Ugh, that's quite a passage. (laughs) A list of do's and don'ts. All week when I was reading over this passage, I was thinking about what it must be like if you haven't been to church in a while, and this is your first Sunday back. (laughs) And you think, man, I, I go away for a while, and I come back, and what do I get? I get a list of do's and a list of don'ts. Exactly what I thought I would get from church. Exactly what I thought I would get from the Bible and from religion. Ugh, more ways that I'm failing. More things I need to do. More things I don't need to do. In fact, it's possible that the reason why you went away in the first place is because you really didn't like lists like these. And by the way, you don't have to say that out loud for that to be true. There's a passive way of feeling like that. You can just read the list and go, oh, that's nice, and then just kind of mentally check out and say, I'm not doing any of that. And when you read the list and the pastor already told you the sermon is on on obedience, that's like a double whammy, right? Like, oh man, I'm really not going to like where this is going. So let me just start in this way. Don't do that. Don't check out. Okay, because there's actually something really beautiful happening in this passage, something far better than just a list of do's and don'ts. In fact, I really think that what you do with this list is the most important thing about you. 
And I think if we find what God has for us in this list, it'll not only change the way we think about God and the way we've cha- it'll change the way we think about ourselves, but it'll actually right here, right now, change our lives. So hang with me as we look at this list and we talk about obedience. And to do that, I have four questions I want to ask. So if you're a note taker, you can write these down. And if not, that's fine. Just kind of think about these as mile markers to help us plot our course. Four questions. Here they are. Number one, what is obedience? Number two, why is it so hard? Number three, what would it take for it to be easier? And number four, how does it make Jesus famous? What is obedience? Why is it so hard? What would it take for it to be easier? And how does it make Jesus famous? Let's start with number one. What is obedience? This is a list of do's and don'ts. In fact, we can work back through it. Here's how it reads. Don't to falsehood. Don't lie. Do tell the truth to your neighbors. Get angry, okay, but handle it well. And don't go to bed angry. If you're a thief, stop doing that. Get a job. Be honest. Be generous. No to corrupting talk. Yes to encouragement. No to bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander. There go most of our family gatherings over the holidays. (laughs) Yes to kindness, tenderheartedness, and forgiveness. And, And you read that and you just think, man, That's a lot of do's and don'ts. It makes me think of when I get in the van with my five kids and we're going somewhere and uh, I start telling them what they're not gonna be allowed to do, especially when we're going over someone's house that I don't know very well and I know they're gonna judge me based on how my kids react. And let's be honest, the odds are not in my favor. I have five of them. Somebody's gonna do something, right? So I start going through the list of things they're not allowed to do. No biting, no hitting. No ramming your sister's head into the wall or any hard surface, okay? And, and I know I have some kids who look for a loophole. If I don't name it, they will say they didn't know it was against the rules. So I'm saying no breaking anything, no touching objects of glass, no looking at objects of glass, right? I'm going through all the possibilities and then I sum the whole list up just in case I forgot something because I know I didn't think of everything. I say this, just don't do anything to embarrass our family. So in case I left anything out, that list I just gave you, here was the point. Don't embarrass our family. And that's actually what Paul is doing here in Ephesians 4. This list is not an exhaustive summary of all the things God wants you to do or not do. You can't print this out and say, this is it. This is all God wants. Instead, he has in mind one thing in particular. And you find that thing in the first verse of chapter 5. Look at what he says. Therefore, since I just gave you that list, be imitators of God as beloved children. You see, Paul says what I'm really saying is that you are God's children. He loves you, and you know that, so just be like him. That really what I had in mind in that whole list is just just this. Look at God, your Father who loves you, and do what he does. Don't do what he doesn't do. Say what he says. Don't say what he doesn't say. Just be like him. He has in mind this picture of a child who watches their father and just mimics the dad, saying, I want to be like my dad because I look up to him, because I respect him, because I trust him. In fact, in this, Paul is actually giving us a definition of obedience, and here it is. Obedience is really just trust in action. That's really what it is. Obedience is just trust in action. Paul says, look, I I gave you a list. Don't, don't, Don't tear down, build up with your words. Don't steal, be generous. Don't, don't be mean, be nice. And yeah, that list is true. But really what I'm saying is just look at God and trust him enough to imitate him, to do what he does, to say what he says and to avoid what he doesn't say and what he doesn't do. Most of us are pretty far removed from trying to mimic our parents, so that analogy might fall a little flat, but all of us probably have friends or family members that in some way, I mean, we would never tell them this, but in some way we want to be like. 
And so we have friends who are good with money and we watch them and we, we trust them enough to mimic what they do with their money because we think they know what they're doing and if they think that's smart, then I should do it too. Or we have friends who are good parents and we watch what they do with discipline or with boundaries or with rules and we say, oh, I should do that because they're good parents. And what we're really saying is I trust them with money. I trust them with parenting. And so in essence, I'm going to obey them. That's really what obedience is. It's saying, I trust you enough to listen to you. I trust you enough to take your word for something. That when you say it's good, it's good. And when you say it's bad, it's bad. And what Paul says here is that when God thinks of obedience, he doesn't think of performance. He thinks of trust. He thinks of children and their parents. Obedience is really just trusting God enough to do what he says and to not do what he says not to do. But if you think about it, that's why obedience is so hard. That's my second point. Obedience is hard because it's really hard to trust anyone or anything other than ourselves. That's really, really hard to do. In fact, you can pick up on that if you just think about the reaction most of us have to this list. Now, I can think of four ways you could interact with this list. The first way is you could obey it. You could read it and go, okay, I'm going to do all of that, and I'm going to not do all of the don'ts. Most of us are not, frankly, going to have that reaction. So that leaves three possible reactions. The first one is you can dismiss it. You can read the list and you go, yeah, I'm not doing that. That's crazy. That's not the way to live. That makes no sense to me. I don't agree with that. I can think of at least six reasons why this list is wrong. I'm just going to dismiss it. Another way, maybe a more polite way, is to downplay it. It's to say, well, in general, this list is right, but not always. I mean, it says don't go to bed angry, but if, but if God knew what kind of person I was married to, he would know it's not, sometimes it's best to leave it. We downplay it. The third way is to demand answers, is to say, well, maybe this list is right, but I have a few questions, and God's going to have to an answer these questions, and he's going to have to explain to me how this list works in every situation before I trust it. But the reality is, whether you're dismissing or downplaying or demanding answers, what you're really saying is, I don't trust this list. And I don't trust the one who gave it to me. In fact, even more than that, what we're really saying when we do that is that the only one we really trust is ourselves. Because after all, when you dismiss the list, you're saying, this list is wrong, but you could only say that if you believed you knew what was right. When you downplay it, you're saying this list doesn't work in every circumstance, but you could only know that if you knew what worked in every circumstance. This list will only make sense to me if someone explains it to me. And what you're really saying is my ability to understand something, my reasoning is what I ultimately trust in. And that's where we find ourselves so often, saying to God, in essence, I don't trust you. I trust myself. Now, this has massive implications for us, of course. Because if that's true, then that means that in your life and in mine, the most fundamental issue is not our performance, whether or not we do the do's or we do the don'ts. What, what is fundamental is not what we say or what we don't say, whether we keep the rules. Actually, what is the most fundamental thing about us is whether or not we trust God. It's important to think about that. Because you see, if trust is actually the issue— if when we read this list and God says to be kind, we don't trust him, then our issues go far deeper than performance. But also, this explains why so many of us struggle to change. It's not because we don't know the rule. In fact, the very Christian thing to do is to read this list and to get out some sticky notes and to write, be kind or be tenderhearted or, or don't go to bed angry and put it on your mirror and put it on your rearview mirror. That's dangerous, but I know some of you are crazy in that way. And 
is to get a podcast about kindness and to listen to it and just say, maybe if I just remind myself, if I bombard myself with the rules, maybe I'll keep them. But here's the thing. Then your spouse wounds you and you go from reading the sticky note on the bathroom mirror that says, don't go to bed angry, to believing that the thing you absolutely need to do is to show them just how mad you are and go to bed angry. What happened? Did you forget the rule? No. No. What happened is that when your circumstances changed, you didn't trust God, you trusted yourself. I didn't trust God, I trusted myself. See, what Paul is saying is what God is after here, and if you're here and you're not a Christian, you so need to hear this. What God is after is not your performance, but your trust. And the reality is, if you think about the area of your life right now that you struggle most to obey God in, I don't know what that is for you, your sexuality, your career, your money, your family, your thought life, your verbal life, whatever it might be. What if what's really going on there is that you don't trust God? That you don't think He wants you to be happy? That you don't think He wants you to be prosperous? that you don't think he wants your family to be healthy, and you worry that if you listen to him, he'll hurt you. Paul tells us here in this passage, that's exactly how God takes our disobedience. Look at what he says in verse 30. He's given most of his list, and then he pauses for a second, and he says this, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not offend God. And that's an interesting thing to say because I read the first few things in this list and I think, wait a minute, really God? This is what you get upset about? I mean, of all the things in the Bible you tell me to do, you're telling me if I don't speak the truth to my neighbor that you're going to get upset with me? That's what's going to make you upset? But what Paul doesn't have in mind is that there are certain performance things that we do or don't do that make God upset. What he has in mind is that when we disobey God, it is always personal to him. Because if obedience is really just trust in action, then what is disobedience? But a lack of trust in action. You see, here's what I'm convinced of. For all of us in this room, I don't care if you came in calling yourself a Christian or calling yourself something else. For all of us in this room, the single most fundamental step we need to take in our spiritual growth and our relationship with God is to be honest enough to say to him, in this area of my life, God, I don't trust you. Because if that's what's really going on, then we cannot fix it unless we're honest about it. So what area of your life would you say, I don't trust God here? And not to belabor the point, but just because I don't want you to miss it because it's so fundamental. This would mean, for example, that if you're struggling with going to websites, for example, that you shouldn't be going to. Your problem isn't that you aren't sure whether or not God wants you to go to those websites. Your problem is that whether you go there for pleasure or comfort or to de-stress, your fundamental issue is that you don't believe God wants your pleasure, at least not as much as that website. You don't believe God wants your comfort, at least not as much as that website. You don't believe God wants you to deal with your stress in a positive way, at least not as much as that website. And until we're honest about that, we will be stuck in this perpetual cycle of sticky notes and reminders and accountability texts, but never actually changing. Trust is our issue. And that leads me to number three, which is to say, well, if that's true, then how can obedience get easier. Well, if trust is the issue, then the only way obedience could get easier is if we found a way that we could trust God. And how does that happen, by the way? Does that happen by God saying to us, trust me, and us going, okay? No. 
Trust is something you win from someone. Trust is something they give you because you've earned it. So what we need is some way for God to so earn our trust that we believe that when he says, put away malice, it's best for us to do so. And when he says, tell the truth, it's best for us to do that. How then will God win our trust? And the answer to that is in verse 2 of chapter 5, where Paul, Paul says this. Look what he says, verse 2. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. You see, Paul says, I know what I just told you is really, really hard. I know. And the only way you're going to do it is if you look to Jesus. And if we look to Jesus, what would we find? Well, if you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the stories of Jesus' life and his ministry, here's what you're going to find. Jesus always trusted God. Always. In every circumstance. And maybe where you see that most is at the very end of his life. Because after all, when you can tell what someone really trusts in is when they're really squeezed. And in Jesus' betrayal and his arrest and his death, what we find is that he trusts God. In fact, the night he knows he's going to be betrayed and arrested, he prays. And he, he says to the Father, he says, look, if there's any other way to do this, can we do it that way? And then after that, he says, but not what I want, but what you want. Or in other words, he says, I trust you. If there's any other way, God, let's do it that way. But if there's not... I trust you. When he's arrested and he stands before Pilate, the Roman government official in the Gospel of John, Pilate says to him, why won't you answer my questions? Don't you understand? I have the power to kill you. And Jesus looks at him and he says, the only power you have is the power my Father has given you. Which is another way of saying, if you kill me, it will only be because my dad lets you and I trust him. Even on the cross, after he's been abandoned by his followers, he's mocked and shamed by those around him. He seconds from death. His last words are, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. In other words, even as he's dying, here's what he says, I trust you. And he dies. And in this way, what you see when you read the Gospels of John is that Jesus is putting himself out there as a test case for us. Jesus is inviting us to watch him and to lean in so that he can say to us, I trust God. With everything, I trust God. Watch what happens to me. So that Jesus' life becomes the ultimate pivot point on the question of whether or not God is trustworthy. And I have to tell you, on Friday, God doesn't look very trustworthy, does he? In fact, those who surround Jesus will say, he can't be the son of God. He can't even know God because if God knew you and God loved you, he wouldn't do this to you. And on Saturday, when Jesus is dead, no one is saying it makes sense to trust God. In fact, what they're probably saying is this is what happens when you trust God too much. This is what happens when you get a little too religious, when you take things too seriously, when you don't think for yourself, you end up like Jesus dead. His own followers believe this. That's why when he dies, they run to a a secret hiding place and they lock the door and they close the blinds and they're saying to themselves, what are we going to do now? On Friday and Saturday, it made no sense to trust God. And that's the whole point, you see, because that's where we live, isn't it? We believe that if we gave our money to God, if we gave our sexuality to God, if we gave our marriage to God, our family to God, our career to God, who knows what he would do with it? He might ruin us. He might destroy us. We might end up dead. And on Friday and Saturday, it seems as though all of that going on in our hearts and our minds is right. But on Sunday, Jesus raises from the dead. And in that resurrection, he vindicates God as trustworthy. 
You see, Jesus vindicates God that yes, obedience to God, even a list like this, may even actually kill you. But God is so trustworthy that even if it does, he will raise you up. Jesus invites us to see that God can be trusted even when it feels like it's destroying you, even when those around you say you're crazy for trusting him. God is trustworthy. Friday may be awful. Saturday may be awful. But Jesus tells us Sunday is always coming for those who trust God. The the analogy I think of here is when I watch a movie with my kids and all kids' movies follow the same plot line. You've probably picked up on this by now, right? Good guy, bad guy. Bulk of the movie looks like the bad guy's gonna win. Bad guy's got all the power. All the brakes go his way. And when you watch a movie with a little kid, it's at this point they look at you and they go, turn it off. I don't wanna watch this. It's scary. I don't want the bad guy to win. And I always look down at them and I say, it's okay, hang in there. And if they're really little, I'll look down at them and I'll whisper, hey, can I tell you a secret? The good guy wins. And with that knowledge, they can bravely face the final 15 minutes of the movie. Listen, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is this way. Because when we sit on the couch and we consider whether or not we would trust God in every area of our lives, when we consider whether or not we would obey him, even when it doesn't make sense, even when it's difficult, even when it's painful, even when it feels like it's going to kill us, and we find ourselves in this moment, eyes shut, hands over our face saying, I don't want to do this. Jesus looks down at us and whispers, hang in there. Can I tell you a secret? Sunday is coming. You see, the gospel of Jesus tells us that all those who trust God will find him trustworthy. All those who depend on God will find that he comes through for them. All those who give their careers to God, their family to God, their money to God, their sexuality to God, their thought life to God, their words to God, their obedience to God, it may not make sense to those around them. It may sometimes not make sense to us, but it is always true that Sunday is coming, that God will come through. Friends, can I ask you, when did you stop trusting God? Why? Has he not earned your trust? Has he not shown himself to be trustworthy? Is it not true that the obedience of Jesus is what made God famous to you? In fact, do you believe that when you die, you will raise from the dead? Why do you believe that? Is it not because Jesus was willing to be obedient even to the point of death so that three days later he could get back up so that you could look at his obedience and say, I know I can trust God because what God did in his life, he can do in mine. Friends, why would we not trust him? And if we do, number four, here's how it will make him famous. First, I want you to see that if this is true, then God wants to make himself famous to you through your obedience. You see, friends, as long as you do things your way, as long as I do things my way, God cannot show himself to be faithful. Because every success will be chalked up to my own ingenuity, to my own wisdom. But when you and I decide we are going to trust God, we are going to obey God, we're going to listen to him in every area of our lives, no matter what it costs, it is then that God can take us through Friday, through Saturday, into Sunday. It is then that we will stand back and we'll look at our careers and our families and our marriages and our children and our lives and say, wow, God. God really is trustworthy. There is so much of God you'll never know if you don't trust him in that area of your life. Because it is in putting him to the test. It is in saying, okay, God, I'll do it your way, that you give him opportunity to come through for you. And I know that's tough. And that's why we need always to be going back to Jesus. 
That's why we sing the songs that we sing. It's why we read what we read. It's why we pray what we pray. It's why we preach what we preach. It's to remind ourselves that we trust God. He's won that from us. He's earned our trust. But second, our obedience will make him famous to those around us. Because just as Jesus says to us in his life and his death, watch me, watch what happens to me. I'm not going to do it your way. I'm not going to do it the culture's way. I'm going to do it God's way. Watch me, watch what happens. And just as on Friday and Saturday, they feel sorry for him, but on Sunday, they know he was right. So also God wants to display his trustworthiness through your obedience to those around you. What if? What if the way God wants to make himself known to your friends and to your family is in your obedience, not just in big things, but in everyday kind of things? As every day you say to those around you, God is trustworthy. I trust him. He has won my trust in Jesus. I will do it his way. Friends, it is then that God can vindicate himself in your life and convince them he is trustworthy through you. Every little thing says something about God. Every little thing. And what our lives ought to be screaming because of Jesus is that he is trustworthy. That we would say to those around us, Friday and Saturday are tough. But Jesus has told us Sunday is always coming. God always comes through. Even if it kills me, he will raise me up. He is worthy of trusting. He is deserving of our obedience. And that is how he wants to convince those around us. Let's pray. Father God, help us for the first time or once again to trust you. Holy Spirit, whisper the gospel to us. Help us to see that Sunday is coming. He has risen. He can be trusted. Help us to do so. Every area. In Jesus' name we pray.